Hey everyone, uh, welcome to the Evaluating Sources or Credibility video. Uh, this video almost, I'm, I'm almost, always a little hesitant to give this lecture because in a way it's so obvious um, that you should care about what you're reading and the, the websites you're reaching and uh, and yet the evidence shows that many, many people do not are not aware of basic uh, standards of evaluating evidence and sources. Um, so for example, one issue that often comes up is people tend to misunderstand the difference between a source and a search engine or a search database. Google, for example, is not a source. Um, Google is a search engine that pulls sources up for you. So I'm as big a fan of Google as many people. Um, and as we'll talk about later, it, off, it also depends on exactly what sort of information you're looking up. That'll be a big topic here. But at the same time, for many inquiries where we use Google, we should be deeply scrutinizing and evaluating each source that comes up. We shouldn't just be taking the top source or even the top few. Um, because as we'll see, what determines what comes up on our page is one or two isn't the most rational process that people imagine it to be. Um, so anyways, even though on some, some level this whole topic seems obvious, it's clearly not obvious because otherwise we'd live in a better world with more clear um, uh, information transfer right? we, we, rather than this world we live in where there's widespread misunderstandings and people are getting targeted on Twitter by the Twitter mob for things that they did many years ago, right or wrong. Um, so anyways. That's my little preamble here. Uh, one other thing I want to point out is just to kind of call us back to the, um, br uh, have us take sort of a God's eye view, if you will, on the class. And um, kind of just to help you understand where we are in terms of the content. So I started this class by reminding you that this is a philosophy class. And philosophy um, is a Greek word that is defined as the love of wisdom. And we found that when philosophers study things, they tend to study things along three dimensions. Metaphysics or um, reality and existence. That's kind of the more highfalutin stuff in philosophy, you know, God and souls and so forth. Philosophers also tend to study stuff along a dimension, a dimension of what's called epistemology or the theory of knowledge, um, how knowledge is constructed and gained and learned. And then finally, um, we have value theory, uh, where philosophers discuss issues of value, what's right and wrong, is there even such thing as right and wrong, is it all relative, um, what's the most beautiful you know, picture or painting, is there, is, does the word art even make sense, and so forth. And anyways, I pointed out that we are in the, cent the second thing, we are in the realm of epistemology in this class, because we're dealing with knowledge. We're dealing with how is knowledge constructed, what is knowledge? And I just want to hone in on two questions that are key to this class. The first is, what is knowledge? Literally, how can we define it? How is it organized? And we've already addressed that question for most of this class. We've addressed, for instance, that knowledge can be inductive or deductive. Knowledge can be based on probability, or it can be based on certainty. And we've spent pretty much the whole previous part of this class working out the details of those differences of inductive and deductive. Um, now we are turning to a different question. And that question is, how do you get knowledge? Where does it come from? How does the knowledge get into your brain? And we talked about what the knowledge is once it's in your brain, certain or uncertain, deductive or inductive. Now we're talking about, but how does it get there to begin with? What is the process of knowledge coming out of here somewhere into your brain? So that's what this chapter in particular is looking at. Uh, how does knowledge come to us? And we call that credibility. So, um, as you can see, the major ideas we'll be studying here, uh, we'll be looking at the difference between claims and sources. We already know what claims are. A claim is just a statement that in principle can be true or false. I'm lecturing right now into the camera is a claim. Um, and sources are where those claims come from. So the source could be, in this case, me. I'm a source. I'm giving you this lecture as a source for you. The reader that I've written that, that I include sources within and citations, that's also a source. Um, a YouTube video you're watching would be a source. Again, Google would not be a source. 
but the things that Google leads you to would be sources from videos to websites um, and so forth. So that's all explained in the reader. And then this is perhaps one of the most important distinctions that you can get out of this class, this next one, the difference between an interested and a disinterested party. Uh, an interested party is someone who wants something from you. They're interested in your attention. They want you to do something, right? They're interested in you buying their product or believing their belief. A disinterested party is somebody who may have information for you, but could care less one way or another as to what you do with it. They don't need you to believe them. They don't need you to join their organization. They just want to give you the information because you asked. Uh, now, as you can see, there is an argument to be made that there is no such thing as a disinterested party, one could say, because every human being wants something from you. We'll talk about that soon. Um, but the way we'll get around that is we'll say, we'll talk about that difference then instead as the difference between being interested and less interested. So even if everyone's interested, everyone has wants something, there are still clearly some who are more and some who are less, right? some who are more selfish some who are less selfish. So we'll get there. Now, obviously, since I was, as I was saying before, this section is on how our information comes to our brain. Uh, that means that our memory and personal experiences are gonna be relevant because as we saw with anecdotal evidence, lots of our knowledge does come from our own experience. Uh, and then it gets codified into memory, which memory is what, what are memories if nothing else, but a result, a, a, a result in our, sorry, not a result, but a, um, um, a stacking in our, in our own brain of our experiences. And then um, we'll look at what we call prior knowledge. And prior knowledge is exactly what it sounds like. It's one of those obvious terms. It's just as obvious as it sounds. And that's knowledge that you already have. It's every time we learn something new, we're bringing to the table existing information in our heads. Uh, you know, right down to the very basic level of like, when I have students in my face-to-face -face class, I assume that their prior knowledge includes the ability to hear and understand English. Uh, that, that just goes without saying. I also make other assumptions about their prior knowledge, like that they can write a basic sentence and that they understand an essay format and so forth. Um, and with you as online students, I of course, in a similar way, have expectations about your prior knowledge and your command of the English language and so forth and your experience with online learning. So every time we learn something new, our prior knowledge is influencing what we learn. And this, of course, relates to confirmation bias. Because in some cases, if your prior knowledge is really strong in one direction, it can actually prevent you from learning as well because you're constantly, um, you know, kind of, uh, you have a bias in one direction that's so strong you're not actually looking at any disconfirmatory evidence. Um, Anyways, and then finally, we're going to determine credibility, you know, kind of the major key term in the chapter as a distinction between the bias that a speaker has or a source has versus their expertise. So there's always going to be some argument that a source or a person or a um, video has a bias on some level. The question is, how does it interact with their expertise? Are they making an effort to minimize their bias? Are they honest about it? Do they put out their good counter arguments that other people might have against their position um, and they still have expertise? In that case, it's probably worth listening to them. Or does it cut in the other direction? Is their expertise pretty minimal and their bias is really overriding anything else um, that they're presenting? Right, so we call someone with high expertise and low bias. Uh, obviously, we'd consider them credible. Okay, so the first thing I do in my face-to-face -face classes here, before I get any further in the lecture, is I ask my students to consider this question, which is just an honest evaluation of where do you get your information from? Where does your information come, come from? And when you want to know something, if you like actually need to know something, where do you go? Who do you turn to? Now, I would suggest, again, pausing and taking a few minutes to do this free ride on your own, but I'm just going to keep going, assuming you've done that. And the first thing I'd say is, a common response is, it depends on the type of information. Uh, so for instance, if there's been many times, I'm a musician, so um, sometimes I'll play electric or acoustic electric guitar, 
and there will be issues with the sound quality um, and I'll be trying to figure out what the problem is. Uh, or I want to get it to do something that I don't know how to get it to do yet. Um, maybe using an effects pedal, for instance. And in those cases, it's very instructive to find a message board dealing specifically with the specific model of whatever I'm working with. The guitar, or the effects pedal, or the mixing board, or whatever it is. And then I see other people who have dealt with that exact problem of that specific model, and it's listed on a discussion. I don't need to know the expertise of those people because the information is already so salient. So do you see that issue? How like sometimes when you want to know something, the information is everything. That's all you need. I would say the same thing about if you're looking up like say a walkthrough on a video game. Once you figure out what it takes to get you to the next level in the walkthrough, if you couldn't figure it out before, and the walkthrough helps you do that, that's all you need to know to know that that was reliable. You don't need to know who wrote it. You don't need to know who the author of the walkthrough was. It doesn't matter because the whole point of that information was practical to get you through something. Okay, so that's one case. Now, on the other hand, um, what if the information you're seeking has to do with uh, uh, scientific evidence? You know, like you want to know if evolution's true. You want to look at your own, um, you know, check your own reasoning and look at the arguments on either side or. Um, or a God debate or something like that. Well, something that has to do with science in particular, you're going to want to to engage with experts. And you're definitely, they, they may have their own biases, but you're certainly, especially in the realm of evolution, you're going to want to look at at least some evolutionary biologists and their opinions on this matter, uh, uh, you know, because that's a topic where the information alone isn't enough. You actually need um, experts who have done the research and who can back up that information. And I'd say the same about global warming. Um, so it does very much depend on the information you're looking for as to where you go, what you turn to, what website you go to. Uh, now before I say anything more, I'm going to point this out. And uh, you'll notice on the discussion board that I ask you to watch this video by Eli Pariser um, on filter bubbles, which has um, been very influential uh, since it came out and I would ask you again to pause if you haven't yet watched it or done the discussion and watch that video and then consider these other questions here on the free write. Um, but I'm just going to go on. So one of the things that Pariser brings to the table here is, first of all, there are some students who, and myself included, we realize that there are ways to get around the problem that Pariser mentions. You can change the settings on your Facebook to limit um, to change your privacy settings. You can get um, uh, uh, web browsers like startpage.com, for instance, that um, have high privacy settings and things like that that prevent advertisers from being able to see all your web uh, uh, searching behavior. There are things you can do, um, but many people don't do them. And many, many of us are too busy to do them. And so um, what Pariser reminds us is that if you're not paying attention, a lot of the information you're reading has been cultivated for you based on algorithms, right? based on your previous behavior. Like you clicked on one thing, they took that into their algorithm, and now you're getting things that are like that again, and you know that just gets multiplied. Uh, and so um, there are certainly ways in which uh, we can um, try to mitigate that. We can try to lessen the amount of um, algorithms that are controlling us. And one of the ways you can do that, by the way, is just going directly to the sources that you like. So for instance, when I look at news now, I don't actually go anymore. I, I don't Google anything. I go directly to the to my favorite web pages, which I like to have a nice variety of conservative, libertarian, socialist, and democratic sources, um, which is something else I recommend to get around this filter bubble problem. Because that's the other thing Pariser points out is that on platforms like Facebook, um, if you click on a lot of liberal stuff because you're a liberal, you're going to get less counterarguments from conservatives. You're going to get fewer counterarguments. Um, so organizing your own consumption of media schedule is something I highly recommend. Taking the responsibility yourself, going directly to the sources and bypassing the search engine so that they don't tell you, what you where you should go. You go directly there. Um, so that's another way to get around this problem. Okay, so let's move on to the um, kind of some of the specific claim, uh, terms and concepts from the class here. And 
um, let's distinguish between uh, claims and sources. Like I said, we already know what a claim is. It's been defined since the first chapter of the reader. Uh, and the source, like I said, is where the claim literally comes from, which could be anything from a blog to a book uh, to a YouTube video and so forth. Now, something to realize is that these are not absolute terms. It's not like um, absolute zero or something. Either you reach it or you don't. It's not like validity. Either it's valid or it's not. Uh, there's, as you can see in that last bullet point at the bottom there, there's varying degrees of credibility. Varying degrees of credibility in both people and the things they say. So, for instance, um, credibility can be lost. Let's just think of the credibility of a person, of a source. Credibility can be lost, like if a news organization that had respectability suddenly engages in some really bad behavior, you know, they, they run an article that was really irresponsible, for instance, um, and uh, a person's credibility can be lost on a personal level too. Like, you know, let's say you have someone who's accused of a crime and is your neighbor and you've always thought he was a nice guy and there's no problem, but then let's say you found out that he had bought a gun the day before the crime occurred. Now you're like, well, wait a minute, maybe I didn't know this guy as well as I thought I did. Right? So a person's credibility based on new information can be gained or lost. People can also redeem themselves. So I remember this historian, I think her name was Doris Kearns Goodwin, who is now very respected again, but she had an incident of plagiarism in the early 2000s or late 90s maybe, and she really took it to heart. She, she admitted she made a mistake, and she admitted she was trying to be lazy in her writing, and she just didn't have time. And she basically um, went back to the drawing board, and she started writing again, and this time her writing was even better. And now she has again earned the respect of the historical um, community. But uh, credibility can be lost or gained is the point. And then, remember, sometimes the source is just obviously weird or wrong. I mean, if I said something stupid like, ducks quack in Morse code, you'd know I was just trying to be funny or I was making a joke. You'd just reject that claim outright. But if I said something like, ducks mate for life, that would be something that should be investigated. Now, here's the other lesson here, though. If I said it, it should actually be investigated more than if a biology professor said it. Because a biology professor would know about, you know, biological functions of beings in nature. I, as a philosophy professor, that's not necessarily part of my expertise. Unless maybe I was a philosopher with a BA in biology, as some are. But I don't happen to have one. So in this case, if I said, ducks mate for life, you should listen to me less than a biologist. Um, now, on the other hand, like we talked about before, you wouldn't want to ad hominem me either. You wouldn't want to dismiss me completely, but you'd be more skeptical in my case. Uh, but notice that the claim ducks mate for life isn't immediately implausible or plausible. It's just like, yeah, it might be true, it might not be true. It's not quite like the ducks quack in Morse code. So sometimes you can see right on the face of it that a claim is going to make sense or not. Okay, um, interested and disinterested parties. Like I said, an interested party, just basically think as an interested party, they have an interest in your belief, so they're biased. A disinterested party has less of an interest in your belief, so they're not as biased, or they're not biased. That's the difference. Um, and so the real question, like I said before, that arises here is, is, does this distinction even make that much sense, given that um, almost everybody wants something from you on some level? So this, to me, reminds me of an argument from the uh, great existentialist philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche and you don't have to know him for the assessment or anything. Um, you should know this idea, though. And Nietzsche came up with a famous idea called the will to power. And Nietzsche argued that at the base of all life, not just human beings, by the way, but plants and animals, too. He said at the base of all organic living beings is this very primitive desire to dominate, to override and take over other things. And we see it when the grass grows through the cement and grows over the cement, right? That's a, that's a very primitive form of power in Nietzsche's view. Um, we see it when two animals are fighting, when the alpha males are fighting to who's going to be the alpha male, right? The two biggest apes are fighting on the hill to who's going to lead the tribe. Um, but here's the tricky thing. 
and human beings, Nietzsche argued, because we're more sophisticated and we're more civilized than animals, we still have that drive. We still want to dominate everyone and everything, but we realize that there are limits to just going out and killing people and taking their resources. We know there are laws. So what do we do? We find subtle ways to dominate other people, right? We dominate in subtle ways. And that might be in a, you know, it's like a little uh, insult in a conversation like, oh, wow, I see you just wear anything, don't you? Right? Like little passive aggressive comment. That's a way of us asserting our power over someone else. Um, that might be seen in a professor who doesn't like a student and angrily writes them a, you know, a bad review on their paper. That might be seen in the student who angrily writes that professor a bad review on Write My Professor. Right? So um, this power for Nietzsche is everywhere and reaches everything and can be very, very subtle. Uh, and even people who don't seem to want power, Nietzsche would say, still desire that power at the basic level. They, if you were to give, even a person who seems to be content without a lot of control, if you were to give them a chance at taking control, Nietzsche argues, they would take it. Right? If you were to give the slave a chance to be the, the one who rules, the slave would immediately throw away his life of slavery and become the ruler. Uh, so Nietzsche says, we all want power. We all want to dominate. Um, you know, people said this a lot too, I'll add this in, um, in, the, uh, in, in some of the hashtag me too um, accusations when powerful men uh, sort of have been accused that's a game of power, many would say, right? The men were, first of all, using their power to control many of these women and to get them to do what they wanted because they had the resources. And then some people have counter-argued and said, yeah, but the women are also using their power to take down these powerful men and advance their careers. And um, that's probably a little bit of an oversimplification of that whole movement. I mean, it's a lot more complex. But my point is, some people have made those arguments that are based on power, even within that domain. So. If everybody wants power, then how do we ever find somebody who's a truly disinterested party? I mean, is there ever anyone who just says, yeah, here's some information, have it, and they don't want something from you? I mean, even your biology professor, when they tell you about evolution, on some level, they want you to believe evolution because they believe it, right? Even if they just give you the facts and say, well, this is what it says, and this is the evidence, on some level, you know they want you to believe. Just like your priest, even if your priest says, yeah, I want you to be open-minded and think about other religions, ultimately they want you to be part of their religion, right? So what do we do if everybody, it, they, they're, everybody sort of lies and they put on this face for the public and deep down they just want you to believe what they believe or they just want to gain money from you or gain resources or um, adherents and followers. Uh, so anyways... The way we get around this, I think, is we acknowledge it and say, all right, maybe everybody does want something from you. Um, I think Nietzsche is deeply right here on some level myself. However, where I think he's wrong is that I think you can have people who still have some level of interest, they still have some bias, but they've made such a strong effort to be disinterested that their bias is much more minimized than in most other people. And I can think you can see this in their personality and their character traits and their research. Do they make an acknowledgement of the other side? Do they make an acknowledgement and try to fully characterize what the other side is saying? Do they um, misinterpret the other side's arguments? Do they, are they respectful to people who disagree with them? Um, are they honest about their own conclusions? Are they overdrawing them? Are they being honest about the premises and the evidence they've built up? Built up? Uh, all of these are questions that would help us determine how interested is the person involved here. Um, so my counter-argument to Nietzsche here is that maybe he's right, but let's just think of it in terms of less interested rather than disinterested. Uh, and so, so personal observations. Now, we already kind of touched on this, like I said, with anecdotal evidence, uh, but I'm going to expand it a little bit. And... Let's remember that our personal observations could include a lot. Right? It, can, it could include like what we just observed, like we just went to a Padres game or something, we saw the game. Um, it includes the thoughts we're having right now. It could also include just basic sensations of like I'm feeling cold, I felt a wind or a breeze. Um, and it could include our memories and our thoughts about the past. 
So our personal observations and experience actually includes a lot, you know, this huge bubble of uh, experience that we've had. And there's a couple things to remember about these that, that are important to remember. The first is that it is the most immediate source of information we have about the world. Right? What you observe um, is what you have. So going back to the Padres game, like let's say I went to a Padres game and I saw them win the game and I was there and I saw the score and I was like involved in it and I was cheering. And then I go home and I talk to a friend and he says, oh yeah, the Padres lost today. I know that my friend is mistaken in that case without having to look anything up because I just had the experience. I was there and I'm gonna tell him, say no dude, I was just at the game. I just, I saw them win, they won. You must have looked at the wrong source. So there are some times when our personal experience completely trumps what somebody else you know, has presented or another piece of information. Uh, but that should be taken with a grain of salt because the second thing to remember, and this goes back to anecdotal evidence, is that it's extremely flawed and biased too. So although there are times when we know something happened, there are other times when we think something happened and we're wrong. Um, when, when, when we think that something went down a certain way. And usually these are more ambiguous things, right? It's like, like sometimes people disagree over a conversation or like, no, dude, we were talking about this yesterday. No, we were talking about this. Um, and that's a little different than the Padres winning, which is something you can observably see. Uh, so the flaws and biases come in as well. I often think about a time I was a kid and um, my friend and I grew up in the same neighborhood. And we grew up since we were six years old. And we were like, at this time, we were, we were like 13 or 14 in high school. And we were having an argument about, a stupid, stupid argument, about um, a park. There had been a park that was torn, torn down and rebuilt. And the old school park, it had like the slide in a certain place and the swing set in another place. And again, very stupid argument. My friend and I were arguing over where the slide had been in the original park, like the one before it was torn down, when we were very young. And we were having a stupid argument, and then I thought it was in the back, and he thought it was on the left, like when you face to the park from the street. And we were sitting here, like, detailing our experiences. And we looked, and um, we saw a picture that my mother had taken back when the park was still there. It just out of chance, we saw it like a few weeks later. And we looked at it and we were both completely wrong. Like I kind of said it was to the back right, he said it was to the front left, and it was actually like in the back on the left. It was like in between where we both thought it had been. Uh, and so it just goes to, sh and we were both very confident. Right? We were both very confident, this is how it is, this is where it was, and we were wrong. Um, so personal experiences have to be taken with a grain of salt. We also have to remember that people can mess with your personal experiences. I mean, if you go into a room with bad lighting, that can influence how you experience a party, for instance. Um, if there's too much noise, the music is too loud, how fast things are happening. Um, if there's more stimuli, if there are more stimuli, if you're constantly seeing people walking by you, that's gonna mess with your perceptions and your memory. Um, if, if, if you were to go stay, let's, let's just say you were going to stay in a new house for the weekend and I was your friend and let's say it was like your aunt's house or something and she said, you, here, you can stay in this house, I'm away, you can have the whole house to yourself for the weekend. She gives you the keys and then I said, well, you know that that house is haunted, right? Even if I was totally full of crap, you know that when you go to the house, that's going to be on your mind, right? Because I put the thought of a ghost in your mind. Every single little creak you hear, even if you're not superstitious, it's still going to have an influence on your perception because I put it in your mind. Um, right? And <clears throat> there's all sorts of ways that our perceptions can deceive us. We see what we want to see. We see what we want to see. And... Um, so even going beyond just our own deeper fears and beliefs, I mean, we can see that our experience is biased right down to what we perceive. That's the point of these optical illusions. So in this case, you have an optical illusion that seems to show you uh, the lines that are kind of not straight, they're not parallel, they're curved. But in fact, they are parallel. And no matter how many times you keep convincing yourself that they're parallel by measuring each part and seeing it, that it's the same, your mind keeps playing tricks on you. Because of where the black squares are placed, it makes it seem like they're not parallel. Even worse is this example, 
where we have parallel lines, but because of the placement of all these other figures, and in this case, the creators of this figure have done it very cleverly, um, it really seems like those lines aren't straight, and yet they're perfectly straight. Um, so our brains are constantly messing with us, even though our experience is the most immediate source of info we have, and it's valuable, it's highly, highly biased. And so those two seemingly contradictory facts uh, kind of have to be kept in mind at, at all time here. Okay, so let's talk briefly about memory because that deserves its own separate discussion and slide. Um, memory we would consider part of personal experience because it's basically your log, your internal log of your own experience. And uh, now I know it's more complicated physiologically than that and neuroscientists would be furious with me for saying that, but you get the idea. Our, our memory on an experiential level, the way we experience it, is as a sort of analysis of what happened before um, and, a, and a, a container for what happened before, for our events, for our experiences. But if personal experience is already flawed, memory is even more flawed by definition because memory is already in the past. At least personal experience, it usually has happened more recently, we have access to it, um, but memory as the example of my friend points out with the, with the park it illustrates, can be highly flawed. And in fact, they did a study in the 1970s that I cite in the reader uh, testing this point. A study by Robert Buckout, I believe, was the researcher's name. And basically what they did was they, they hired some actors from the local university, and they hired these actors to start a fight in front of, uh, in, on, the, on the quad, in front of everyone, just to see how people would react. And also to test how much, how well they would remember what happened. Now, this fight was staged. So the actors being good actors, they sold it. They made it seem real, right? They were really like tussling and fighting, but it was all staged and they had practiced it. And so when they start the fight, they go through their routine and they know exactly what's gonna happen. Like who's gonna punch whom when and you know how it's gonna go down. And as usually happens when people start a fight, there was a group of kids, you know, students that went around them and said, fight, fight, and they, and, um, they start watching. They fight, they finish, they leave as though it was real. And then the researchers come in and they interview 10 people who were right close to the fight in, this, in the front of the circle. And they interview and they ask them basic questions about the fight. Um, what happened? How did it go down? Who punched whom first? Um, you know, what did they look like? Who was the perpetrator? Uh, what color hair did he have? And so forth. And they got it really wrong. So the respondents, the people who had literally been right there watching the fight, a fight that had been planned right, in advance where they knew the outcome, um, even just a few hours later when they were asked about their experience, there were contradictions, they disagreed with each other over what happened. Um, N nobody got it all right. There were some people who got some things right, but nobody got everything right, even though they were right there standing up close. So this suggests that our memories are flawed and, and weak and uh, depend on what we want to see. Now, um, I would encourage you to watch, if you haven't already seen it before, you may have seen this in a psychology class. Um, it's called an, the Gorilla Video or Invisible Gorilla Video in a way that name already gives it away, but there's some other variations, so if you look that up, you'll see a few really short videos that illustrate how flawed our memories can be. So anyways, we gotta be humble too about our memories, because our memories too can be quite flawed. Our memories can also interact with our desires, so if I like certain things, for instance, if I'm more predisposed to say, like music, I'm, if, if, if let, let's say you and I both go to a party and the next day we're talking about the party. If I'm more predisposed to like music and like a certain kind of music, I might, more, I might have noticed the music at the party more than you did. In fact, I might say, yeah, they had this really cool song and it was this like jazz funk or whatever. And you might be like, oh yeah, I didn't even notice. On the other hand, you might care more about people than, than music. So you might be like talking about what people were wearing and talking about, and I might be like, well, I didn't really notice that. That's not important to me. So our own biases and desires also interact with our memories because we choose what we want to remember that is more valuable to us. So memories are highly, highly flawed. 
Okay, prior knowledge. Uh, like I said, prior knowledge is just everything you know. There's a more technical definition. The body of justified beliefs consisting of facts from our personal observations and facts from others. Now, the trick is, is that it's a body of what we believe to be true, what we believe to be facts. However, sometimes we can believe things that are facts that are not facts. And that can get us into a lot of trouble. Um, we can believe things that are not true because somebody told us they were true and we continue to believe it and it was never really um, questioned or challenged. This is obviously worse when you've been indoctrinated by a very, um, you know, uh, opinionated um, upbringing where you had parents who were really strongly on one camp or strongly part of one group and um, they make it really hard for you to challenge those core beliefs. Uh, so anyways, that's prior knowledge. Now, <clears throat> a couple things I would say here. Um, uh, the first thing I'd say is one thing that would help you understand prior knowledge, and I do ask my students about this in my face-to-face -face classes, can you think of an experience where your prior knowledge was either verified or disconfirmed or proved wrong based on new evidence that you encountered? So was there something, in other words, is there something you thought you knew that you either saw that was true based on future experience, you were like, oh yeah, that was verified for me, that's right. I thought it and it was right. Or did you have other things that you believed were a certain way and then they were proven to be false down the road? Um, that's a good way to understand how prior knowledge works. If, if you can think of an example on your own. Um, now something else about prior knowledge is that it's actually what we've accepted in our prior knowledge determines when we think something's weird or not true or not. So for instance, if I were to say something like, well, palm trees grow in abundance in the North Pole, right? there's a bunch of palm trees in the North Pole, you would probably, especially if you're from Southern California and um, Latin America, you'd probably reject that because you'd say, well, wait a minute, palm trees tend to grow in warm weather, right? That's, t that's sort of where they evolve, that they tend to grow in warmer climates. So that they grow in abundance in the North Pole, that doesn't that, that's going to conflict with your prior knowledge of palm trees and their habitats, um, right? Or if you, or if I said something like, "There's a Tyrannosaurus Rex," this is even worse. There's a Tyrannosaurus Rex at the San Diego Zoo. Right? I hope everyone would say, "No, this isn't Jurassic Park yet." As far as I know, we haven't genetically modified, you know, brought back dinosaurs from some tree sap. There's no T. Rexes anymore; they're extinct. So right away, you'd reject that because it conflicts with your prior knowledge. So you have to see your prior knowledge sort of like as a bubble of information that you think is true and you believe more or less, some maybe more than others. And each time you go through the world and you encounter new information, either it sticks to that ball of knowledge or you reject it and throw it away. And what you've accepted in that ball of prior knowledge determines what you accept and what you reject um, as new information comes in. Now, I do need to point out again, because this is important, is that um, sometimes if you have false prior knowledge, it can actually hurt and inhibit learning when it's activated. Uh, you know, for instance, if you believe that vaccines cause autism, uh, that could be a barrier to learning about how vaccines work, right, if you're already convinced of that position. Something else that sort of interacts with prior knowledge is uh, what we call initial plausibility. So initial plausibility is just a fancy name for, is it worthy of being believed? Like, it doesn't make sense at first. So initial plausibility is like how reasonable it is when you first hear it. And the Tyrannosaurus Rex claim was unreasonable, right? That it, it conflicted immediately with your prior knowledge. So it was not initially plausible. On the other hand, the, the claim I mentioned before that ducks mate for life, that is initially plausible. There's nothing in the laws of physics that precludes that possibility. And if I didn't know it, I would say, yeah, that, that could be that could be true. So that's initial plausibility, um, right? So, you know, if I said a new uh, a new if, if I said a new zombie show is going to be added to Netflix next month, right? Considering how many shows we know that Netflix adds to their programming all the time, that's not an. Uh, a claim that's that's an initially plausible claim and especially if it's zombies 
we know that um, the zombie genre is going alive and well, uh, uh, even though The Walking Dead is sort of getting towards ending. Um, there's plenty of zombie shows. Everybody loves them. So it's not, it, it's pretty plausible for me to say um, that Netflix might add a new zombie show. Right? It's not an implausible claim. Um, on the other hand, if I said an 87-year-old woman swim across Lake Michigan, it's a little less plausible. 87-year-olds usually aren't that um, athletic, although there are, could be exceptions. So it's not completely implausible, but it's got a lower level of initial plausibility due to um, what we know about people who are 87 years old. The best strategy, I think, and, and this is the unfortunate part of this class, is that I wish I could give you like a you know deductive argument that everybody has to accept and it's absolutely certain as to how to be a good critical thinker. But I can't. Being a good critical thinker just means employing a number of different strategies. And the best strategy in this case, I think, is you should have a healthy skepticism of what people say. Uh, you should have a healthy skepticism even of professors like myself and other experts and other um, authority figures um, while also keeping an open mind. And you should always remember that in history, um, many people who have said things that are weird and strange at the time often end up ended up being true uh, and making a lot of sense later. You know, from early feminists to early prohibitionists against slavery to Einstein to Galileo and Copernicus. Um, so it's always worth uh, trying to see beyond the prejudices of our own time and trying to be as open-minded as possible while also remembering that there are many whack jobs out there who are just going to talk your ear off about a bunch of bullshit. Right? So it's a hard line to toe, but one way to do it is respect everyone and listen to everyone and give them a chance. And if they reveal that they're not really themselves being um, open enough and honest enough with their own biases, then you're okay in um, not accepting that, that view or that belief that they're presenting. Okay. In other words, like Socrates, right? We talked earlier about Socrates, and um, Socrates always had an open mind and was always willing to debate and get down to the core of an issue and talk with someone. And um, so, anyways, that's my recommendation. So, credibility, like I said, is going to be an evaluation of the difference between expertise and bias, and um, expertise we are going to measure in terms of the experience the person and, and it does depend on the subject matter right there are cases where expertise matters the most and education doesn't matter as much uh, for instance i might see um, being a garage mechanic a, a car mechanic into that in that camp to some degree there are schools where a mechanic can learn some really technical skills but there are also people who have a natural inclination with mechanics and have been working on cars since they were six and they don't need to go to school, right? They, their experience has taught them everything. So experience and education both matter, but there are cases where maybe one supervenes over the other, depending on the topic in question. Accomplishments matter, reputation matters, position matters um, to some degree. Uh, now, reputation is interesting though, because it depends on among whom you have a good reputation. So if I'm a um, mechanic, let's use the mechanic example. If I'm a mechanic and I have a good reputation among other mechanics, that's probably not as valuable as if I have a good reputation with customers. Because if customers are satisfied with the mechanic, it means he's doing a job that, you know, where he's doing what he said he was going to do, customers are satisfied. And if I'm a customer, that's what matters most to me. Were the people whose cars he worked on satisfied? But if it's just that other mechanics are like, yeah, he's a really good mechanic, I mean, it's something, but it's not quite as good. So there's a lot of variables here is the point I'm making. A lot of working parts. Obviously, the education thing should also be taken with a grain of salt because there are ways to get that doctor in front of your name by you know getting a two-week PhD online. Um, so you should also kind of research and make sure that if the person is touting their education, that they have education from a legitimate school, I mean, a legitimate um, place, uh, whatever it is that they're, that they're touting. Okay. Now, the other thing is, is that experience alone isn't everything either, 
right? They're, they're, uh, the reputation matters a lot too in conjunction with experience. So for instance, you could have a mechanic who has just incredible experience. And I'm, I'm just kind of sticking with the mechanic example to keep it consistent here. Um, you could have a mechanic with incredible experience, but who's dishonest, right? Who's so biased in the other way that he'll do anything he can. He'll make things up. He'll pull out a spark plug to make a customer think that it's messed up and he'll charge him more to fix it. Um, there's been documented cases of people who do that, repairmen and so forth. Um, so just because a person has a lot of experience doesn't mean anything either. You need to know something about their character and their reputation as well. Um, so again, all these things interact. And then finally, uh, bias, of course, interacts with all this. Um, how interested are they, right? How much do they want you to believe what they're saying? Uh, how much do they want you to buy their product or to pay more money for a new car part? Um, right? How, how, how invested are they in you believing them or coming to their side? And if that's very high, then in some cases it can override their level of expertise. And I'd say the example I gave in the mechanic earlier, uh, who is you know pulling out spark plugs and making things up would would fit that because even though his expertise is high he knows about cars his bias it just overrides the expertise there's just no question now a couple other things about experts something that's really tricky is that experts can disagree and this is something that messed with me a lot as a young student when you see people who are both highly educated who are both decorated uh, who, who are both respected in their respective camps, and yet they disagree strongly on particular points. On a particular point, um, going back to uh, when we talked about in chapter three, when we talked about science and Thomas Kuhn, uh, this this hap this is actually happening in health right now. There are some experts in health who believe that carbohydrates are the main source of weight gain and um, detrimental health effects. And they are very decorated. They've gone to good schools. They have good reputations. They've worked as doctors for many years. And yet there are people on the other side who think they're completely mistaken and that calories is still the best way to understand weight gain. Um, we just need to modify it. And, and they're decorated and they're educated, right? So in areas like this, it's very hard for common people like you and me to come to a conclusion. And I think the best answer here is to go back to what I said on previously, which is um, you're justified in some skepticism of both sides. And um, uh, sometimes you just have to say, well, we don't know yet, right? Sometimes you just have to be content with, well, experts disagree now, and maybe you can choose a side tentatively, but you're still just waiting for more information to come in. So it's also okay to just say, we we don't understand, experts disagree. There doesn't always have to be an answer for everything. Um, and so, in other words, it's okay to suspend judgment sometimes and, and just say, I, I don't know yet. Other times, experts get falsely judged, people get judged to be non-experts by irrelevant characteristics, um, basically ad hominems. They, you know, they might be nervous, they might, um, uh, stutter a little bit in their speech. Maybe they're not wearing as nice a tie as the other person is and um, They don't look you in the eye There's no evidence by the way that any of these traits are linked with being a bad person or not being an expert It just means that you're nervous you have different traits and yet sometimes people would judge a person with those characteristics To have less expertise, which is completely irrelevant. It should never be judged by that um even the clothes they're wearing, right? Even right down to the jackets they're wearing. And obviously, racism comes in here. Sexism comes in here. Um, you know, more traditional people might be unconsciously more willing to see a man as an expert than a woman. Uh, and all of that obviously is completely irrelevant to expertise. We also tend to pe think people who are taller, more assertive, they speak more strongly, they're more confident. We think of them as, more ex as having more expertise. But again, all of these personality traits are irrelevant to expertise. Somebody could have studied climate change for 12 years and be an absolute expert, but just be nervous when he gives a presentation. Maybe he just, that's not his style to look people on the eye all the time. Doesn't mean he's not an expert. Doesn't mean he doesn't know his shit. So that's another problem that comes in with expertise is that people get judged for false characteristics uh, 
that aren't relevant to expertise. And I often think here, and I, I recently watched the um, uh, drawn out documentary of Ted Bundy on Netflix. Ted Bundy was a good looking, extremely manipulative, confident, good speaking guy who was actually able to get a degree in college and nearly become a lawyer. Uh, and yet he was murdering people, women, constantly. Uh, you know, perhaps the most famous, at least at the top of the list, of serial killers in American history. And yet, if we were to judge him based on the characteristics for expertise, like good-looking, tall, attractive, that some people do, he would be an expert, right? So um, we can't judge people's nature based on irrelevant, surface-level behaviors. And that's the problem. Okay, so... Um, So I point out in the reader that um, there, one way to evaluate, because there will be questions on the assessment as to whether somebody's credible. And like I said, the way to evaluate is bias versus expertise. So one way to evaluate these questions, like the one I'm going to put up on the screen here in a minute, I'm basically going to give you a claim or, or a, a category to think about, a subject to think about. And then I'll give you people, and I'll, and I'll ask you, um, are these people, would these people be experts or not regarding this particular subject? Okay, so that's the, the sort of format of these questions. So let's look at that. Let's say the mechanical condition of the car you're thinking of buying. We're going to continue with the car uh, topic. And you have these following options. And your, your task is to think, which one of these is the most credible to consult regarding the mechanical condition of the car for them to give you accurate information about the mechanical condition of the car you want to buy. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and rate each one based on their expertise versus their bias and then it'll help us draw a more clear conclusion about who's the most credible. Now you'll see that some of it, it will be obvious already, but I'm just going to go through the motions to help everyone get into the habit. So the used car sale, car sale person, the used car salesperson, the former owner who we're assuming is different from the salesperson, the former owner's mechanic, you, and a mechanic from an independent garage. And now we're going to go through and figure out what is the expertise and bias of each, each of these people. And remember, we're trying to find someone with high expertise and low bias because that would be the most credible person. So the used car salesperson. Let's just say, and I'm gonna rate this versus, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rate their bias and expertise kind of, you know, in a basic way. And I'm gonna say either it's low, some, or high. And there might be some split hairs here, but just kind of follow me and let me go through the whole process first before we, before we get there. So I would say, for instance, that the used car salesperson has some uh, expertise on cars, on the mechanical condition of a car. Because oftentimes a person who works with cars is going to have some knowledge of at least basic, you know, maybe knows how to change the battery or the spark plugs. Um, not a lot. I'm not going to give them a high level. Uh, but I don't think they have none either. So I'm going to say they have some expertise. On the other hand, their bias is ridiculously high because they are a used car salesperson and they want you to buy the car. So they're more likely to lie or um, over-exaggerate or under-exaggerate issues with the car in order to get you to purchase one car and not purchase another and so forth. So their bias completely overrides any expertise that they may have had. Right? So we're not going to choose them. How about the former owner who we're thinking is different from the salesperson? Well, this person would have, um, first of all, we, I, we, we just don't know, and there's a lot of unknowns in some of these questions, so um, I'm going to say that their expertise is just unknown, so I'm going to put a question mark there, uh, and, but that doesn't matter because we know that their bias is high. Right? They're the former owner. They're going to have some stake in selling the car. They're going to want to get more money for it. Um, and if they can, they're going to want to pay less to repair anything that might have, you know, be at issue in the car. Uh, so just all things considered, the owner is going to have a higher level of bias. So we're not going to go with them either. What about the former owner's mechanic? Now, right away, we know that they're a mechanic. So their expertise is certainly high, certainly high in that case. 
they know about the mechanical condition of a car. However, their bias, I would argue, would be high too, because it's the former owner's mechanic. There's a possibility that they may have had a relationship. There's a possibility that um, they may have worked together. They may be friends, and it may be that the former owner's mechanic would be more likely to undersell a problem with a car so that his friend, you know, his customer could get a better deal. Right. Again, we're not saying this is probable, we're just saying all things considered, all other things being equal, if you had a person in this category, what could they possibly do? So I would say even though they're high expertise, their high bias ruins it. Now you, um, uh, I'm going to say, and is another question mark for the experience, um, uh, for the expertise because we don't know who you are right it depends on you however most people are not mechanics right so i think you know, it might be fair to say some expertise but there would be probably low bias for you because you are honestly trying to assess the mechanical condition right you're going to look at does it really work does it really not is there really an issue so you're not biased with respect to the condition of the car um, If there's no outside, you're not gonna you're not gonna over or under exaggerate the problem. If if you discovered there was a serious problem, you wouldn't buy the car. If you discovered that it actually did work, you would. So you're actually looking for the real condition. You don't have a reason to inflate it to sell anything to anyone. However, if you had a mechanic from an independent garage, uh, then you would have your choice, wouldn't you? Because although yes, there might be some bias in anyone. It just you know there might be some bias in this person just like there might be in anyone but given all the other options this is the best one because we know that since he doesn't know the former owner he's less likely to have any sort of um, considerations that are going to get in the way of his evaluation and he's more likely to just tell you yeah hey this is what the car looks like um, and of course he's going to have eye expertise because he uh, um, obviously is a mechanic Okay, so I'm actually just gonna do that one because um, those are a little bit long and I think that emphasizes the point. Uh, you'll have, there are examples in the reader and you'll have other chances to do these questions in the classwork and homework. Now before I wrap up, I'm just gonna say a couple other things about the news credibility and the internet in general. I'm gonna start with the internet. Uh, and so, the internet, it's funny, when I first started doing this, the internet was still kind of considered new, and it was considered, I mean, it's still evolving. Um, but back then, uh, it was actually even less prevalent. And so I still find myself having to remind people again and again that Google isn't a source. And so I want to do that one last time, that Google is a search engine that leads you to sources. It is not a source. Now, Wikipedia comes up again and again, too, and what I've also seen Wikipedia evolve since I've started teaching. It used to be a laughing stock. I mean, teachers used to make jokes about it. It was just students made jokes about it. They would, you know, joke that, oh, yeah, I wrote my whole paper from Wikipedia, and today it's become much more respectable. Uh, now, that doesn't mean, I still don't think that it should be used as a primary source, but it's a very good starting point, as it says there on the PowerPoint. It's a good place to start your search for knowledge. And you'll notice that on any given Wikipedia page, you can go down to the bottom and there are actual sources. And I couldn't recommend that more, that as you're going through a Wikipedia page, you're following the numbers for the sources and you're occasionally linking off just to see what's how the information on Wikipedia is being backed up. Um, and don't forget that even now, at any given time, you could be reading a Wikipedia article and you could be reading false information because anybody can edit it. And at any given point in time, somebody could have changed something. Now, that's much less likely to happen with more um, tried and true pages and topics. So for instance, the page on evolution, the page on philosophy, um, those are pretty well put together and have had a lot of years of being edited and improved. Um, other pages that are newer, you might want to be more skeptical about. And always remember that at the top of a Wikipedia page, it'll say, like, this, this article doesn't meet Wikipedia's quality standards or something like that. This article needs more sources, or this article talks in too informal a tone, or something like that. 
uh, pay attention to those. And I would recommend if an article says anything like that, don't read it. Don't 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 take it seriously. You should only be reading articles from Wikipedia as a starting point only. And they should be articles that are tried and true and do not have something that says the quality standards are not met. So that's Wikipedia. Now, we've been incredibly lucky in the past couple of years, in my opinion, to see the prolif proliferation of podcasts. Uh, and it's this really incredible new development. And I don't want to jump the gun here because a lot of times people get too excited. They say too many, they make too many predictions about new technologies. Um, I was actually watching a stand-up comedian in 1995 ripping on the internet and talking about how it was going to go away in like, uh, you know, the next six months it would just be a fad, right? How wrong was he? Um, podcasts, I'm not sure where they're going to go. I, I was initially very excited. I'm still excited because a podcast is basically an extended radio show with fewer commercials or as many commercials as the creators want to include. More and more have commercials these days, but... The nice thing, and I think the reason people like podcasts, is that they allow an extended conversation to be had that isn't just based on these five-minute clips like, you know, CNN or MSNBC or Fox News. They bring in an expert, and then he can make his point for like two minutes before they cut him off and, um, you know, talk about fallacies and biases. I mean, it's just, it's not even worth watching those. That's why a lot of people reject them. But in a podcast you can extend an argument, you can really ask, you can get an expert on there, you can ask him or her questions and really get to the core of the matter. And there's no, there doesn't have to be a length requirement. Again, it's whatever the requirement the podcast creators want. So I think podcasts are great because uh, it brings out all these new possibilities and um, the possibility of having really good deep conversations. On the other hand, there's freaking thousands of them now and there's so many. Uh, it's the onion did a funny article on podcast recently that I won't, I can't remember it, so I won't say it, but, um, look up the onion and podcast and you'll see it. Um, there's so many now it's hard to even keep track of them. Um, and we don't know exactly where they're going to go. Uh, so I'm skeptical to make a conclusion, but I am very excited and I do think there's a lot of positive developments from them. However, just to tie this to credibility in that last bullet point there. Whether it's a blog or a private website or podcast, you have to remember that the expertise of those sites depends on the expertise of the creators, the ones who put it together. And so if you're reading a blog from you know some dude who never finished his sophomore year in high school and he's spouting off, I mean, it's, it's going to be less credible than uh, you know someone who uh, has had a lot of experience with something and is more reasonable and um, is more, more educated. It, it depends on the topic, like I said before. But you get my point. Um, the credibility of the blog depends on the credibility of the creator. Same with the podcast. Uh, so that's why it helps to research the credibility of those people. Um, and remember, it's not an ad hominem to research someone's credibility as a bolster to their argument. It's only an ad hominem if you, or an appeal to authority, if you fully support someone's view because of their expertise or you fully reject it because of their personal characteristics. It's okay to consider them as part of your reasoning process. And that's what we're doing here. So here's some sources that I personally recommend. Now I want to be clear, sometimes when I present these things, students are like, or people, you know, like, oh, we forgot about this, we forgot about that. This is not exhaustive. These are just some sources that I find useful that, um, and especially when you consult them together because they include a broad range of perspectives, uh, I think are very valuable. And to try to combat our confirmation biases, which in my opinion is the worst, most prevalent bias, we have to make an effort to read experts on the other side. Uh, and one way we can do that is make sure our media diet includes good uh, experts from the other side. Right? Don't go to Fox News if you want to understand conservative thought, because Fox News is a biased conservative source. Don't go to MSNBC if you want to understand liberal thought because that's a more biased liberal source. However, if you go to, say, The Nation, right, that's a much more reasonable, well-thought-out liberal source. Or if you go to The National Review, that's a more reasonable, well-thought-out conservative source. Uh, and so you want to be able to make those distinctions. Um, now, I like to include in my um, media habits also some sites that 
or more centrist, like reason, is a is a site for libertarians and free thinkers that, as they describe themselves. Uh, and what's cool about those sources is that there's sometimes where I really don't agree with what they say, but there's other times where they come in with a really balanced perspective, where I think the conservative and liberal outlets are really missing something, and they kind of bring it all together. And again, by keeping your media diet mixed that way, you're more likely to kind of throw off your own biases. Some podcasts that I really like that I think are more open-minded, um, Very Bad Wizards is a podcast between a philosopher and a psychologist. It's very funny, um, but also very erudite, educated. Um, Rationally Speaking um, is great. Waking Up is uh, done by Sam Harris, who I don't always like, but um, I think he has excellent guests and he's a pretty good interviewer, um, and so forth. I'm not going to go through all of those. And then remember I mentioned um, search databases. Google Scholar is a great place to go if you're not, uh, it's free for people who are not in universities. Um, It's like Google for scholars, like it says. So it's going to take you not just to a bunch of commercialized sources, but it's a Google for people who want to find legitimate, more peer-reviewed academic sources. Uh, So if you don't know that, you should try it. And I also mentioned for privacy, start page, um, you know, to eliminate that problem that Eli Pariser had identified before. Okay, folks, so I'm going to end that lecture there.